us up, everybody. Welcome to the stack. I'm Alex. I'm Justin. I'm Pete. And Baby. on the stack, we talk about a ton of books that come out this week. Let's kick, let's kick it off talking about Doctor Strange number one from Marvel, written by Jed McKay, art by Pasquale Ferry, Andy McDonald, and Ian Herring. Doctor Strange, if you couldn't tell from the title, he's alive. He's back. Whoa. He died Whoa. for a while, but he's back now. It's all good. He didn't die he's, for that long. Not that long, but he is back. Well. He's hanging out with Clea. And a lot of this issue is reestablishing him in the Marvel Universe, as well as what's going on with Wong and his agents of Wand, who are magic shield agents, essentially. So there's a lot of setup in this book, but Jed McKay, reliable writer, Justin, I know you're a big fan. So, how did you feel uh, about yeah, Justin, this you're a big fan. of Stephen Strange? Well, I am a huge Jed McKay fan. All the um, the Black Cat stuff that uh, Jed's been doing over the past past few years. I also love Pasquale Ferry on art. I feel like this is a great combination. Oh, nice. Gives Doc Strange a nice, clean, new look. Uh, I think it's funny that both Scarlet Witch and Doctor Strange are sort of like, we're open for business, just walk through this door that's slightly more magical than this other door. Uh, but that's, hey, that's fun. It's still, still a good premise. I like the sort of, we get to see Doctor Strange's week. The tone is is a little fun. Doctor Strange has a good sense of humor, which I like. There's some relationship stuff, some larger stuff. I'm super excited for this run. It's a great jumping on point for some great Strange Strange. Uh, yeah, I mean, the thing is, we had this magical, tripped out Doctor Strange. Uh, <laughs> yeah, we had this magical, tripped out Doctor Strange story before this. And so this isn't as like amazing or as uh, like uh, visually entertaining as that was. Although the art on this is r super type bananas. It's just a little different. We came from this like really kind of stylized interesting unique look oh this you're very... you're talking about the doctor strange fall sunrise which is you're yes, goddamn right i am yes a different book not in this continuity it's not telling the yeah. same oh story. it's still doctor strange book show shut the fuck up then sure it's but it doesn't take place in the correct order that is something that takes place earlier in the timeline Okay. But I mean, I, I get it. Pete, you really liked that book because it was super trippy. This is definitely more like sort of mainstream, great, super heroic Doctor Strange stuff. So it's a yeah. slightly different flavor, but it takes a lot of flavors to make a, the great stew that is our stack. Yeah, I hear it. It's just when you're... The you weekly know, stew. Yeah, it's just when you're, you know, you really love something and then they change it a little bit. You know, you can have some feelings about it. It's okay. Well, that's like being mad if, um, like, say, the fall sunrise was setting, and you were like, no, the sun's gone. What do we do? It's dark. <laughs> that's, I and yell at I, the sun every night when it goes down. I know. Honestly, we're very, very worried about you. Yeah. It's a little more like if there were two unrelated sunrises, and you were like, what the fuck? There's this sunrise <laughs> over here, and it doesn't connect to this sunrise? Uh, this sucks. Good thing Pete didn't grow up on Tatooine. <laughs> Here's that be my true. one qualm uh, about this book is uh, I really liked it. Well, no, no, no. I, th I thought the art was really good. I thought the writing was really good. But I spent a I lot. Of, uh, I, I'm going to agree with Pete now. I spent a lot of the time no. of this book being like, what's the take, though? We've seen this before. Uh, this It felt like an extension in particular of Donny Cates run to me. Uh, but. Three quarters wow. of the way through the book, some stuff starts to happen that really changes up the situation, throws in a mystery, throws in some riffs, and I'm glad they got to that point because I was enjoying it. I liked it as a Doctor Strange book, but with a number one, I want to take as strong as Scarlet Witch that feels like something that is wholly new that I'm reading. Well, Justin, let me throw this out, it, wait, wait, before you just, Justin, let's just sit in this moment a little bit, you know? No, Alex wow. agrees with me and he disagrees with you. This is just, let's just it's, sit here it's, for a little bit longer. Oh, it's nice. It's very funny that a moment ago we were like, isn't it crazy how Pete screams at the sun? And Alex immediately was like, <laughs> yes, and I agree with this madman. <laughs> so I feel like I'm sitting pretty and then non-screaming at the nighttime guy. Uh... But let me just respond, like, because what I love about Jed McKay's writing in particular is the characterization, like the Black Cat book that he just yeah, ran for yeah. years on wasn't like super premise heavy, but it was just like great storytelling from a plot narrative point of view and great character work in, in each issue, in each panel. And so like, that's what I'm looking forward to here. Something where so many comics are like big premise and then 
that's sort of the whole engine. And Jed McKay is specifically good at the opposite of that. So I'm here for that. Well, let's talk about another character-driven book, Batman, One Bad Day, Ra's al Ghul, number one from DC Comics, written by Tom Taylor, art by Ivan Rice. Like the rest of these books, this is exploring one of Batman's villains. This is, I felt, a surprisingly more traditional Ra's al Ghul tale, talking about the Lazarus Pits, talking about the environment and man's destruction of it. You get a classic shirt off Batman sword fight with Ra's al Ghul going on here, very reminiscent of the Neil Adams stuff back in the day. Yeah. What you guys and the think? Batman about this? animated series. Batman animated yeah, series. Exactly. What you guys think about this one? This uh, I I continue to love these uh, one bad day stories. They're really fun. They make some big choices. I think this was a very interesting take on someone who's been around for a while, you know. And I I just thought it was. Uh, yeah, very unique and cool, and they had amazing covers for this. I just uh, think the art was super tight bananas, and I've been loving these uh, these collection of stories here. This is just really cool. I agree. Ivan's art is great here. Really good matchup. Again, this is not a bad day. This is actually a great day. Raish has a great day in this book. Yeah, so, but when he's having a great day, we're having a bad day. That depends no, on your I take in the plot. I, here's well, what I if take, I'm one of the been... 27 people killed, yeah, I'm going to say it's a bad day. Oh, in this in the DC universe, you're a, a evil the, multi-billionaire? No, the, the, the That's what you're day, saying, Pete? The bad day is his dog dies, right? Like, I know that sounds this like isn't a John joke, Wick. but that's, that's legitimately what happens is this wolf or dog or whatever that he is. Yeah, it's a fucking really wolf, time. man. It's not just a regular dog. Ah, woo, it's a wolf, man. Right? Yeah. A wolf, a wolf is just a... D- I don't know. A wolf is just a dog who's having one bad day. <laughs> one right? bad day, a wolf. I My don't... dogs are one bad day away, day away from straight up killing. Me. Oh man, <laughs> don't don't you talk shit about Pip. <laughs> Pip don't Pun- slip. Punisher bro. has a, a dog and a wolf chained up on a roof on a chimney, and he's like, "You do your one bad day away." Which from one me. do you feed? <laughs> Which yeah. one do you feed? Exactly. We have a bunch uh, of things going on here. Lots of metaphors and some posters and T-shirts. On the Punisher. <laughs> Anyway, this is a good. Book. And in that, in those moments, that's when I, the Punisher, was carrying you down the beach. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's those footprints. That's print. why there. That's why there's boot prints on that that's beach, right. bro. <laughs> and when I looked down, I saw a line of bullets, and that's what I knew. I was shooting you. <laughs> I was shooting the ground and hovering a little bit. I was shooting so many bullets. So like that's hopping up a little doing. bit. It wasn't flying necessarily, but I do Hoisted that by now. my own petard. What I was going to say about the what it what, oh were you, you going to say you, something about this book or did you want to? No, I, I actually like this story. I thought this is a okay. good book. Uh, the moral complication of it I thought was really cool. Uh, really, like this, if you're a Damian Wayne fan, not that he's in this a ton, also, but it's Batman, sort of like the tis two poles. Batman kind of loses in this issue. It's a rare loss for Batman. He has one bad day. I'll tell you that much. Yeah. Mm. Now, guys, are you get access to a Lazarus Pit? You jumping in there every couple? Uh, Weeks. I was thinking about that while I was reading it, and one hundred percent, definitely. Yeah, uh, Justin, if you're going to be there every time I come out to tell me everything's going to be okay, it just seems like it'll be worth. It. I'll be there. I'll be in the pool with you. We'll have our bathing suits on, a beach ball. <laughs> hey, Pete, jump in the last pit. Let's heal up a little bit. What's the what's the weakest? Like, what's the uh, least sick you'd be to jump? Like, you got a sniffle. You're like, I gotta jump <laughs> I'll in the jump in this floor. I'll tell you Stub why. Your toe. Earlier today, and this is a true Paper story. Cut. I got locked in the bathroom for 15 minutes down here in my basement. 100. <laughs> percent If there was a Lazarus pit outside, I'd be like, but, I'm getting in the bathroom. Wow. Just jump Absolutely. in the Lazarus toilet that you have. Wait, because you had 15 <laughs> minutes of inconvenience. You were just oh going to kill yourself. I was going nuts, bad. I almost <laughs> tore the door down. I literally physically ripped the door handle off of the door. All right, She-Hulk. So and that's what locked you in? Uh, or no, you later? Yeah. It's a whole story. I don't want to get into it. We're it already, like we're it. only Sounds two like a, It was two one of your kids, in. like, to lock you while you were in there? No, nobody else was home, and my phone was outside the bathroom. So. There it is. That's the real thing. And I was going feral. I was like, yeah. Oh, yeah. There were there was a wolf and a dog inside of me, and they were one bad day away from becoming each other. Can we move on to the next book, The Neighbors, number one, from Boob Studios, written by Jude Ellison S. Doyle, art by Letizia Catanici. This is perfect for fans of James Tynan's work in particular. Mm. It's very reminiscent of Something is Killing the Children in terms of the art style. It's also very reminiscent of The Closet in terms of the content of the book. Ah. 
This is about a family that moves to a new neighborhood where all the neighbors, super weird, super terrifying, horrible things are going on. There's some interesting stuff going on in terms of how trans issues affect a family because one yeah. of the partners in a marriage, they're moving, presumably, because one of them came out as trans. It's affecting the kids in different ways. It, the horror ramps up very quickly over the course of this issue. I love the art style. Like I said, if you're a fan of either of those books, I think you're really going to dig this one as well. Yeah, the tone, you're spot on. This is a very James Tynan style book, uh, down to the great sort of uh, twist, I guess, uh, at the end. There's a sort of a double twist where it's the there's a, something happens and then there's a uh, a really? couple words that are used yeah. that really twist it, twist it again, and I thought that was really well done. Art is great. The the way that the panels, the art goes into like sort of details uh, on hands and snakes and stuff. Just really nice horror, uh, cinematic horror stuff here. Yeah, when I read this and I got to the end, I was like, nope, no, this is too fucking scary. This is scary as fuck. No fucking way. This is. I, that, uh, that's why you got jumped in the Lazarus kiddie pool out in front of your house. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I was like, no fucking way. This is too scary. And uh, it's great. It's a great kind of scary that's very impressive, but I could not deal with it. It was. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm it's definitely a legitimately out. scary book. And I thought of yeah. you, Pete, while I was reading it because I knew that was going to be your reaction. It's a little tub, too much for you. So. And I don't mean this dismissively. If you are a scaredy cat like Pete, this is not the book for you. Yeah. But for everybody else, great stuff. Very excited to read Scaredy more. Kitty. I said, anytime I read a comic book that's too scary for Pete, I send him an edible arrangement. <laughs> uh, thanks, man. I wish that was true. Punisher number 10 <laughs> from Marvel, written by Jason Aaron, art by Jesus Saez and Paul Azaceda. The Punisher is continuing to rise or fall, depending on how you look at it, to become the Ooh. avatar of the Beast. Meanwhile, Maria, his wife, who is back to life, is finding out a lot more about what's going on in the background. Maria, Pete. his wife. Pete, take it away. <laughs> Other than the singing, please. Uh, just, I, I, this is just going so hard and is so much fun such a there's so many amazing badass moments also the avengers having the, like the worst bad timing awards for showing up as soon as the punisher goes i'm quitting i'm done uh i was like what well, now you guys show up after he's like fucking done uh but uh it should be interesting to see where it goes from there i just i the where they were like, it's a bad day if you're one of the worst people in the world it was just great. I just started clapping. I was having so much fun with this book. It's really interesting. Uh, so we're getting to know the Punisher a lot in this, as well as his wife and their connection and all of that. It's very interesting. This is very cool. Uh, I'm I'm just having a blast. Thank you, Jason Aaron. Thank you. Uh, I love the way the art style switch from the present uh, sort of uh, scarier, grittier story. Or it's, no, it's actually less gritty, I feel like. The more uh, darker reds and blacks of the present day and the flashbacks, which are grainier and whatnot, uh, looking at the Punisher's past. Very cool. And this is actually secretly, the Punisher isn't, we're talking about him, but we're not really riding with him. This is really a Maria story, and we're really getting to see her and her take. And I love the way that she sort of, likes Frank's descent into becoming the Punisher as we're learning. And she's actually more like him than I think we've ever thought, a character that was only ever murdered and <laughs> never explored. So to actually do that in such an interesting way, I think is excellent. And I gotta say to have like Cap, Black Widow, Wolverine, Doctor Strange and Moon Knight show up and be like, hey, let's get the gun guy, he's being a dick. And this and the Punisher is more super jacked, overpowered than ever. They're gonna murder these dude. Moon Knight is oh, it's done. Especially his series is <laughs> mediocre. Get him out. He's dead. Yeah. If, uh, Great first stuff. off, don't just throw, say things. His series is mediocre. F fuck you for bringing that up. Okay. Do you want the Moon Knight to kill Punisher? No, I'm just saying you don't have to bring that up. That's not relevant. I like how every issue you bring up a new matchup for Pete to hurt his feelings. <laughs> I'm not trying to. I don't know. I'm trying to hurt his feelings. No, you're you just gonna, he, I'm not trying to. Yeah. Okay, you're God. Oh, Pete, son. you really want the Punisher to kill your mom? That's what, what? you want, Pete? Nope. Your mom is going to show up next issue, and uh, I guess you want your mom to kill the Punisher or vice versa. You're going to have to make a decision. That's going to be Milestone. Yeah. 
Now he's being mean. <laughs> <laughs> Me, I'm being mean. Milestone 30th anniversary special number one from DC Comics, written by Evan Narcisse, Nicholas Draper, Ivy, Stephanie Williams, and Jeffrey Thorne. Art by Adagun Ilhan, Chris Cross, Nicholas Draper, Ivy, Yasmin Flores Montinez, and Sean Damian Hill. This is exactly what it sounds like a series of stories that loop into various points in the milestone history, some that have existed, some that have never existed, that they're teasing things going forward. A lot of it all hooked around static in particular. Pete, I know you're the big milestone fan on the podcast. What did you think about this? This was awesome. First off, amazing covers, just really such a cool collection of stories. Uh, Dexter Vines is killing it. I love the mm. feel of the art. Uh, it has this kind of like up 80s feel, uh, but it's updated a little bit more. I also really love the Batman Beyond and Static story that we got in this. This was such a cool, uh, I just feel like this is such such a great collection of comics and had such a not uh, only interesting story, but an artistic story to tell. Yeah, agree. Great variety in the stories, but that Static Beyond story I thought was so good. Yeah. Definitely a, fa a fave, and the art that really stuck to the Batman Beyond stuff, but really brought Static in, I thought was super cool. It really yeah, worked. I, I agree. Just speaking as not a Milestone fan, the first story is very much like Crisis on Infinite Milestone Earth, yeah. bringing them yep. all together. Yep. That was a very deep dive for me, somebody who doesn't know much about the Milestone stuff. So I was a little worried that the rest of the book was going to be like that, just like for hardcore fans only. But it's not. Like we're saying, the rest of the stories are very fun, very accessible, and with some great art throughout. So it's a good collection. And this is such a little thing, but just structurally, DC doesn't do this enough. They do this for the Milestone books. They have title pages between everything yeah. where they give the credits of everybody and they give a little bit of a recap. And I appreciate that so much. We read so many comics to just have that little bit of, oh, OK, this is what this is about. And then go into it. I thought it was phenomenal. Yeah, right. it's great. Dead Romans, number one from Image Comics, written by Fred Kennedy, art by Nick Marinkov. And do you think this has something to do with Dead Kennedys because you got Dead Romans and Fred Kennedy? I feel like there's a no. connection there. Stop. Yeah, strong. I mean, musically, strong sweet shout out, but other than that, you go fuck yourself. Yeah. That's your conspiracy <laughs> theory. Wow. Wow, you're a real, real F Bob dropper this episode, Pete. What did you think about this book? Uh, well, I, I think it's worth it for the art alone. I mean, you got some amazing colors, shapes, love the blocking. The <laughs> so blockiness. many shapes. Oh my god! Honestly, most words. of this, most <laughs> no, no, of this no. comic is shapes. Hey, no, fuck yourself because they do like this interesting thing where it's like uh, people become like more blocky in the background and different stuff. And I think it's a cool stylized choice that works really well. I have a question for you, Pete. When you yeah. say it's worth it for the art alone, does that mean, and this is a real, very real question, does that mean you didn't like the story for real or you didn't connect as much with that? Well, no, it means uh, different things for different uh, stories. For this, I was just so impressed with the artwork because we see so many comic book and a lot of superhero kind of driven stuff. So to see characters that were blockier and, and different shapes, uh, and, and like different colors kind of spurting out, it really makes a huge difference. And, and, and someone who's reading a lot of similar stuff, it really sticks out. So I, yeah, I just really want to tip my hat to it and say, as someone who reads a lot of comics, when you get something that's new and exciting, it, it makes it just so much more refreshing and nicer to add to your kind of pull list, you know? Great. And follow-up question, when you say super tight bananas, does that mean you're being held hostage and that's a cry for help where you're like, please come rescue me? <laughs> no. Because I'm no, trapped just, here. I'm just uh, so impressed with the art. It's just Well, I'm going to agree with Pete again. I do think the art was very good in this book to give you a little sense of the story. It is about a general, I guess, in the Roman army who is – in love with a slave, he keeps promising her that maybe she's going to be his queen someday if he ever becomes king. Of course, they get attacked, they get thrown apart, she's left alone. Presumably the story is going to be her growing up to be a badass and fighting her way back to him or something like that while he fights his cool. way back to her. I did feel like the writing was a little convoluted in this first issue. 
Yeah, they, I think it was it was just it lacked a little clarity of what was happening, I feel like, especially um, in the beginning. But I do like the sort of uh, plot that they've laid out. Like, I think it is interesting. I, I would like to see both of them, uh, our general sort of dealing with the bureaucracy of his fight in because they're in like Europe, basically, uh, the, up in Germany, what would be later become Germany out of their normal area. So it has the opportunity to go in a lot of different directions. Uh, and so I'm down to keep reading this. Yeah, same. Definitely want to check out a second issue now that they've set up the situation. Let's talk about She-Hulk number 11 from oh, Marvel, boy. written by Here Rainbow Rowell, art by Andres Genelet. This is a big time ship oh! issue for She-Hulk and Jack oh! of Hearts. They can't really touch anymore because Jack of Hearts is now radioactive again. She-Hulk still really wants to be with him. Jack of Hearts is clearly stepping back. We've talked it's about heartbreaking. This, this is heartbreaking. Uh, the two of them yeah. together are just magic. And to see uh, this awkward kind of dinner that doesn't work and has us as well as them questioning their relationship is heartbreaking. And then some fucking new guy comes in. Uh, just all fucking some cool, cool. sexy gentleman thief comes in who yeah, I think is. is going to present another option for she-hulk or i'm i'm worried about it because i'm shipping this other relationship and now this new guy shows up and he's thrown off his mask and he doesn't care and uh, oh man and you saw him throw his mask off so you were like that guy's good looking that's a problem that's what mm -hmm. you thought right pete as a rom-com expert like legit legit you're a rom-com expert you watch more rom-coms than anyone i know yeah yeah that's a sign when it's like uh, uh, something gone to Ray and all of a sudden two people who maybe shouldn't be connecting all of a sudden are connecting and looking to each other's eyes. Uh, you got It's dangerous. I, I mean, Jack said I'll save you some garlic bread and that would be enough to have me coming home to him. <laughs> You're goddamn right, buddy. Yeah, I hear you. I love the love fact, that. and this hasn't been necessarily every issue because we had some big Hulk fights going on previously, uh, I think an issue or two back, but... When is the last time or ever we've gotten a pure romance comic from Marvel? The entire yeah. time we've been yeah. talking about comics. Love this. Love also, this. Even love when, I even love when they, they launched their romance comics like line, it was all a bunch of like fucked up stuff that kept happening. <laughs> it was like, oh, okay, not what I not what you sold me. So it yeah. is really nice. And also the front half of this book is like a superhero fight club. Which is fun, great character choices. Volcana, a character we don't ever really see much of. Like, this is all fun, and then you get into the real pluck in the heartstrings, right, Pete? What's, what's great about She-Hulk is she, she is such a great character. Uh, there's all this great kind of violence and action you can do with her, but also the small moments with her are just so powerful, and you feel them. Uh, I just I feel like there's such a great range with her and I think they're using her in a great way, especially in this title. And it's heartbreaking. The, the most kind of heartfelt stuff are just these small moments in this horrible date. And you, you just really feel it, man. Yeah, I just want to give a quick shout out. If you are enjoying this book. Last night, I read, and this is an older book, but a book called Pumpkin Heads, which is a graphic novel by Rainbow Rowell with art oh, by yeah, Faith Aaron Hicks. Heads. Have you read it, Pete? Yeah, holy shit. Yeah, it's a blast from the past. So good. It is about two people who work at basically like the Disneyland of pumpkin patches, and it's their last night working there. They've been the MVPs working there for several years. And the guy has always been in love with this girl who he doesn't know the name of, who works at the fudge place across the way from their place. They work at the succotash place. So it's very silly and very over the top. And so they make it their mission to try to track her down so he can tell her how he feels about her over the course of the night. You can kind of figure out how things are going just based on the situation, but it's so fun. It's so charming. Again, if you're, Enjoying She-Hulk, you're enjoying Rainbow Rowell's work on it. Highly recommend checking it out. It was such a delight. Let's move on to talk about what I know is one of Pete's favorite issues of the week, DC's Legion of Bloom, number one from yeah. DC Comics. Yeah, written by Ashley Allen, Kenny Porter, Zach Thompson, Calvin Kasulke, Julia Anta, Kevin Scott, Travis Moore, and David Wildgoss. Art by Isaac Goodhart, Brian Level, Hayden Sherman, Vitter Kafagi, Alan Pasalacqua, Adagun Ilhan, Travis Moore, and Riley Rosmo. This is a collection of stories kicking off spring in the DC universe. Pete, ah. 
Why did this on. one hit for you so hard on this first day of spring as we are taping it? Well, first off, like the Riley Rosmo Superman stuff was just oh wow hard agree oh, hard agree God. really great I uh, get you in the feels uh just some amazing amazing stuff it, it just looks so cool and you kind of really feel the emotions with the character I I think they did such a great job but also like the most adorable Captain Carrot, like, I, w I couldn't believe that story. It was so cute. Took me so by surprise. I was like, Captain Carrot, all right, here we go. What are we going to do here? But I thought it was such a fun choice. Also, the Blue Beetle, the the Swamp Thing stuff was great. Then Dove, I, I had such a uh, such a great time. The Poison Ivy story, where she's just hanging out in a flower shop doing good for people. Oh, I just, I felt like they did such a good job of like having this cool theme and bringing in this collection of stories. Art, uh, of course, was super tight bananas across the board. A lot of really fun choices being made. I, I just feel like this is a smart idea because it's like, taking great stories, putting them with great artists and just letting them run in such a creative, cool way. It, it's a blast. Spring is here. Uh, I liked a lot of those stories as well, especially the Superman one, the Swamp Thing one I enjoyed. But uh, the one you didn't shout out that I really liked was the Batman story, the second story by Zach Thompson and Hayden yeah. Sherman, which had sort of a scary horror element. Great last, last panel, I thought. Uh, but a lot of fun in these pages order and outrage number one from dark horse comics written by jim starlin art by rags morales this is a book that takes place i believe in space and things happen in a non-sequential order throughout the book what did you guys think about this one hmm well alex what did you think about this one Feels oh that's a great question my main thought is i'd love to hear what you guys thought oh ah, interesting because nice. my main classic thought volley. was wondering about uh what you thought <laughs> Yeah, uh, this is incomprehensible nonsense that is beautifully drawn <laughs> by Rags Morales. I'm sorry. I love Jim Starlin. Like, on an individual basis, if you look at this page by page, if I saw this in a museum, I'd be like, cool, these are some wild space pages by Jim Starlin who knows how to write this stuff. But every page, and maybe this is the point, and maybe I'm mentioning it, he keeps jumping from scenes where it's like, this is one of my least favorite things anyway, but going like, then now because yes. that's so non-specific in terms of a time period just like say when we're going to and it's right. fine or indicated visually because we're reading a comic book but he keeps changing up the words throughout the book it's sometimes like, it's before yeah then now before after here there far near everywhere big, everywhere small here's a cock and balls i i didn't know what was going on and maybe you guys do <laughs> Yes, there is a cock and balls in the book. Thank you for bringing that That's up. That's not a, anything to be mad about. That cock that happens. Balls. What? <laughs> that is I how I tell. That's how honestly, I tell. Honestly, I always go into something <laughs> wanting to like something, and this one I came out completely flummoxed. Did you guys feel mm -hmm. differently? Is, is how'd you feel about it? I, I don't. I think I felt as flummoxed as you. As you, if anything, for me, it was just like this book is moving so fast. It felt like they it had to be written in a hurry or something. But the art is so meticulously done. So you were and, saying it's like too fast, maybe too for us. Uh, excuse me. Uh, I do think it you is. You said that as if that was a pun, and it's not. <laughs> <laughs> It is outrage. It's this order and outrage, more like out of or order and outrage, Ooh, right, guys? Uh, you did there. The and there are some of the the little vignettes that I feel like, oh, this is interesting. Like the one that Pete was mentioning at the end with these two characters in bed. Like I, this scene is interesting, but like to Alex's She's point, it's very hard to tell. Scared for her life. Yeah, well, I'm curious what it means. It's yeah. hard to tell how this scene connects with a lot of the stuff that came before and sort of what it's amounting to. And it did feel like we were like, all right, we got to keep going. It's like, what, why are you in such a rush? It's a well, comic. And, and one of the things is that like Rags Morales is, like you were saying, such a detailed artist who draws in this very DC classic superhero style. If it was something that was supposed to be avant-garde, throwing you into these different situations through these different time periods, then it's not clear how you exactly connect. 
you need a different artist for that. It needs to be something right. that breaks apart the art and down into its component pieces the same way the storytelling is doing. Otherwise, it doesn't necessarily make sense. Or even multiple artists or multiple styles of art, perhaps. Yeah. I just, it was jumping around a lot. It was hard to, um, once I kind of got the idea of something, it was on to something else. So I just think that, like, there's a lot of great ideas. I'm looking forward to maybe in another issue too, when maybe it's found a pacing or something, uh, you know, kind of picking back up with it. Wasp number three from Marvel, written by Al Ewing, art by Kazuya Nee. It's funny that we're following up the last issue with this one because this Agreed. is the most broken apart issue of Wasp. They are two wasps have been taken over by old enemies who are controlling their minds and breaking them out into different time periods and realities, though it probably exists just in their mind. Uh, I've been very into the series, but this is another one that I had a hard time holding on to. Justin? Agree. I really like Al Ewing, and especially this felt like almost uh, a companion book to the Ant-Man series that we all liked uh, earlier mm -hmm. that Al Ewing also mm -hmm. wrote. And this book, I feel I'm, it's so hard to follow, and I don't know really what the point is. I feel like it's a lot of characters like, oh, they're both wasps. They, they're, they're mad at these other characters for very particular reasons. It feels like there's some avenging that needs to happen. But I, I, it doesn't ever sort of come together why and what they're doing. And it feels like none of the characters have control of the situation. Even the villain feels like he's like, ha ha, come get I, me, maybe. I uh, I really like the creature design and the art. I think it's very cool and unique. Uh, I felt like this was very fast paced, which I think also made it kind of a little bit hard to kind of roll with. But, uh, yeah, I thought it was very interesting and uh, kind of sucked me in in a way that I was like, maybe I'm not sure happening now, but I'm definitely going to kind of check back later. This was very similar to me to Al Ewing's Defenders work in terms of breaking down reality. And it contrasted with the first two issues, which were pretty straightforward. I'm still curious to check out the last one because I like what they're doing with the series and Kasiani's art is really gorgeous with the character oh, designs, like Pete was saying. But this one was a hard one to hold on to. Nightwing 102 from DC Comics, written by Tom oh, Taylor and C.S. Picot, art by Travis Moore and Eduardo Pensica. In this issue, Nightwing has been captured by the Smiling Man, a new villain oh, who is coming God. after this little girl. Freaking who, me the fuck out. The goal of Neron. Neron, I think? Uh, I say Neron, but Neron. I don't know. Okay. It's one of those Magneto, Magneto guys, I guess. Yeah. Anyway, he is coming after Nightwing, and Raven wants to go after him. Um, we've been loving this book. Do we continue to love it? Real quick, because I feel yes. like we talk about Nightwing a lot. We all love Nightwing. Every issue is very good. On the count of three, let's say whether it's Magneto or Magneto. Ready? One, two, three. Magneto. Magneto. Right. That's all of us. Okay. Thanos or Thanos? Ready? One, two, three. Thanos. Thanos. You say it wrong different. every you time. You say it wrong. <laughs> Why you tell, don't tell me I'm wrong? We You're can say wrong. wrong. What did they say in the movies that we watched? Different continuity. The comic wow. book continuity may have a strong okay. A. <laughs> uh, this, dark this side thing, or dark seed? It's dark side, you fucker. I don't People know. I actually, it... I actually use both. <laughs> it's not oh, dark okay. seed. It's dark yeah. side. It's dark side. Yeah, thank you. Okay, so this Nightwing It's comic, also Magneto, so... <laughs> uh, this Nightwing comic is... <laughs> is really great. I, I'm just... I don't know what it is about somebody who's smiling when they're doing horrible things that creeps me the fuck out. The smiley yeah. guy was really giving me a lot of stress. So the... Kind of like the fact that we, you know, caught him... Stop! Both of you, stop smiling. Uh, the fact that we caught him uh, really just kind of like is a, just a, such a relief. It was uh, uh, such a huge, huge uh, happy relief, and uh, I feel great about it, and I'm having a blast with this comic. Uh, great review. Great. This, they really snuck uh, this Teen Titans book into the underneath the Nightwing cover. <laughs> it's uh, weird to me that they're doing a Titans book, because that's what this yeah. is. This is a full on Titans book. And like, I'm not, I don't mean to be super negative in that way, but I'm just surprised. Well, I'm not mad per se. Like I, I ride for Tom Taylor. It's a good Nightwing or it's a good 
Titans book, but the Nightwing stuff I've been really enjoying. So as long as we keep getting that and keep exploring that, that's cool. But this is truly just like an action Titans story. And then we have a backup that is like a, a sort of a mystery. Detective it's like story. if you went to the deli and you're like, hey, can I get a turkey sub? And they're like, yep, no problem. And you got the turkey sub. And then it was turkey and roast beef and salami with a little prosciutto. Oh, so it. they added some nice right? stuff. And yeah. you're like, yeah, this is good. It. And I like this, but that's not what I ordered. Yeah, I ordered one Titan, and you gave me all of the great meat Titans that you have in your little <laughs> bin there. Yeah. Blue Book, like, number two from Dark like Horse, sandwich. written by James Town the Fourth and Michael Avon Oming, art by Michael Avon Oming. In this book, we're we, following... What? Can we talk more about sandwiches with each comic? You know, like each time we review a comic, we talk about a different sandwich? Was that Absolutely. This is like a fucked-up, inside-out sandwich that's going to fuck you up. Well, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, what know. if you went to the deli and they put turkey on the outside and a piece of bread <laughs> in the middle? That's Blue Book number two. Anyway, this book is following two stories. We are getting a story of a couple who was kidnapped by aliens and following them in the 1950s, I believe. And then the backup stories are quote-unquote true stories of alien abduction or meeting with others. In this case, it's some green people yeah. who are probably fairies. The backup story is entirely made by Michael Avon Oming telling it. Amazing package. I love this book. Another just great, super confidently written book by James Tynan. Like, it's so good. Uh, it's mysterious. It's There's t a tension underlying it. Interesting time period. Interesting focus. It's like exploring just straight up classic alien, uh, alien arrival stories. Michael Avon Oming's art is really good. It's so spare, which very much his style, and it really matches with our front story. It's just great across the board. Yeah, I really agree. JT4 is killing it. Also, the art- I can't lose. The art does such a great job of capturing these moments and these kind of like still moments uh, are so, the tension is so great in kind of these UFO encounter situations. Uh, it's just such a great team on this book. It's very interesting. It's unique. Um, yeah, I mean, if you're not into UFO shit, then you probably won't like this. But other than that, it's it's really solid. This also, I'll mention, feels like an extension of Department of Truth, even though it's a different mm, series. Interesting. And this is top tier Michael Avon Oming. He is just killing it on this book. The backup story right. looks like an illuminated manuscript come to mm. life and it is gorgeous i yeah. as much as i like the front story this year this one the backup story was the was the top tier one for me so great stuff mm. definitely pick up this book undiscovered country number 24 from image comics written by scott snyder and charles so art by giuseppe Camincoli and leonardo marcello grassi we're finally finishing the time travel story that has been going on and moving on to the next zone of america towards the end of this issue as well as corn. a big twist the giant corn the giant corn zone yeah uh, corn as well zone. as a big twist that's going to change everything about the book potentially what do you think about this one i mean this, this continues to Oh, sorry. Go ahead. It's just why everything about it is wild. It's like similar types of adventure, uh, but they're, all the details are different. The characters are still just fighting their way through. Like, we got to get to the next zone. I was like, do you? You think the next one's going to be better? The corn's too big. The corn is too big in that zone. What if that corn starts popping? With global or, warming being what it is, perhaps in this world? I mean, Obviously, when you see giant corn, you got to think, okay, there's going to be a giant monster who eats this giant corn because so why else would it need to be this big? See, I thought giant butter huh. and hopefully big salt mm. and then like some of those little corn holders uh, so you dude, can you are, to get your hands listen, I'm not salt here, man Yeah, I'm not here for your big salt fucking, uh, you know, takes. All right. I know you're. What do you don't? Salt. You all don't right, put salt on your corn? You don't put salt on your corn? Butter, bro. Uh, uh, butter. Oh, butter can, I give you, can I give you a hot tip about corn? Here's what you want to do, right? Take the butter, you mash it with salt and pepper, right? So you make like a compound butter there. Uh, if you want to put some herbs or whatever in there, you can probably do that as well. We're not but... here. This is not like now. This is important. No, we do it's this. Important. We you do gotta this. understand this. My kids don't like the herbs, so I usually just do it: butter, salt, and pepper. Take it, rub it all over the corn, wrap it in tin foil, and then cook it, ideally on the grill, for like 20 minutes. Rotate it halfway. Funny. No, I know. So, like, it really soaks time. in there in the butter. So good. Anyways, 
no, this, at, Pete, before you don't, we all have a recipe to say on this episode. So, like, <laughs> Alex is doing his. We talked about this. We were all going to have to eat. He got corn giant corn. <laughs> he got that. giant corn. And you're doing a, a Swamp Thing Green Hell salad. Uh, and I can't <laughs> wait. I can't wait. And I'm doing. Uh, yeah, what are you uh, doing? I do. Great yeah, question. What do you do? Dab them <laughs> cheese balls. Dab them cheese balls yeah. is what you have. them cheese balls. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Charles Soul is an amazing writer. These continue to be super creative and, and impressive. Uh, I mean, the one guy's writing uh, Transformers, like Shockwave. Uh, I was like, oh, that is fucking really cool. Uh, this is just continues to be super creative, very enjoyable. Each comic is. Uh, fucking crazy adventure and uh i've been eating him up just like giant corn uh each um what year do you think we're gonna have real transformers because this is set in the future pete uh i'm gonna say uh 2070. Oh, yeah. wow much I, I feel I'd like say... maybe we won't live that long <laughs> <laughs> that you gonna... put a year that you were gonna see <laughs> no no i'm gonna come back as a fucking decepticon and wreak havoc wow <laughs> Wow. <laughs> Amazing Spider-Man number 22 from Marvel, written by Zeb Wells, art by John Romita Jr. Was... We're finally getting into the arc, finding out what has happened to Mary Jane and Spider-Man. Turn on what happened is they got sucked into an alternate dimension, uh-huh. which is run by totems, where a evil god being is trying to kill Spider-Man to unravel the web of life. Leads almost directly into the place where we found Spider-Man, I think, at the beginning of Amazing Spider-Man number one. Justin, I know you were very excited about this, so take it away. I mean, we had this big swing where Spider-Man and Mary Jane not getting along. Mary Jane has a a kid and uh, with another guy. And we're like, six months, how did that happen? Like, truly, how did that physically happen? A and B, like, what's the deal? So, like, I, it was a big mystery that has been just hanging in the air for quite some time. And this issue, to get into some spoilers, like a, a heartbreaking moment where uh, Mary J- Peter Parker, Spider-Man, is the one who is sort of under threat here. And so he's trying to save Mary Jane, get her back to their Earth. And instead, she flips it and he lets him escape so that he isn't immediately killed. They love each other. They're both trying to sacrifice for each other. And because of that, because and time works differently in this dimension, like he she is there with this guy. And obviously, uh, we're going to see more what happens there in the future issue. But I thought it was just a great heartbreak breaking grounded sort of way to get into like how this relationship change happened. And I think we still have to find out why everyone on Earth hates Spider-Man. And maybe that's also where we're going to find out, because that's where Zeb Wells run started. Everyone's mad at Spider-Man and Mary Jane is uh, married with another guy, married to another guy. Pete? All right. So this is very hard because it's if I, this is just about before it's all going to go to shit. Uh, so it's just this magical moment where it's a sweet pocket where you've got a Spider-Man story mm. that has him and Mary Jane in love, sacrificing for each other. And John Romita Jr. is doing the art. So it's a magical little pocket here before it all goes yeah. to shit. And just to mention, when you're Every talking about a sweet pocket, you're talking about like a hot pocket with cake inside, right? That's yeah. right. Sweet hot pocket, pocket, they say. Yeah. And uh, every relationship has a sweet pocket. I still remember yeah, mine with my wife. Oh, man, there was that sweet pocket I remember in the beginning. Yeah. Uh, anyways, I think it's one of those things <laughs> where uh, I don't want to keep going forward. I want to stay here, but this is... Uh, great art and, and uh, a fantastic story and what we love about Spider-Man and MJ and the reason that they are the best ship, uh, you know, so um, it's going to be shitty and sad when we move on and find out some other bullshit story. But right That's- now is just it's sweet. It's uh, it's Peter Parker and MJ together willing to risk it all for each other. And it's a perfect scenario. We're about to enter more of a savory pocket. Where it's just, it's less sweet, less cakey. Yeah, not for everybody. Wonder Woman number seven. Wait, you know what, Alex, what's your oh, take what? on this? Oh, I, on... I have some reservations just in terms of the whole totem thing and Spider-Man dealing with gods That's and stuff fair. like that. Not really my thing. I like it when he is more dealing with realistic threats. Uh, there are stories that have made it work, and I do think the emotion is there and the tension is there. And like we've been talking about, 
John Reno Jr., you know, unimpeachable in terms of propulsive action in the art. So I like what they're doing here. It's just the tone. You hate totems. The villain. You, You're you, a totem the, hater. Yeah, the villain doesn't quite work for me. That's fair, and I agree. The that. villain is a little under underbaked, like a... If you didn't put your hot pocket in mic- the microwave for long, uh, right? And it's still like we talked about with the last issue. It depends a lot on. Oh, you remember Amazing Spider-Man five thirty five, right? That's one of your favorite issues, and it's not. <laughs> you know, I don't remember wow. any of this, wow. so I can I, I can gather it, but I don't have the emotional resonance of what's going on here yet. Wonder Woman 797 from DC Comics, written by Becky Clute and Michael W. Conrad, Josie Campbell, art by Amon K. Nahulpin and Caitlin Yarsky. If you haven't read Lazarus Planet, Revenge of the Gods, number one, definitely check that out because it leads directly into this issue where Wonder Woman has been captured by Hera and the rest of the Wonder Squad, as I like to call them, is on the warpath. Oh, uh, the Wonder, the Wonder Squad. Squad. How are you guys feeling about this? This uh, continues to be fantastic. Uh, the art super type bananas. Uh, uh, you get the squirrel is back, so that's great. I mean, there's a lot of f- cool action. We're moving the story forward. Uh, Wonder Woman is is doing great. I, I'm I've been loving this. This Becky Becky Cloonan is killing the game. I mean, we've been really on board with this run. Um, I'm trying to think because we, we got the announcement that Tom King is uh, taking over this book. And I feel like each of these issues that we have left are more and more precious. And I, I feel like we don't have that many left, a handful. No, um, so, we really don't. It's a little bit of a bummer because they have been doing such a good job. Obviously, I'm looking forward and curious to see what Tom King is going to do on it. But And then maybe Becky will come back, hopefully. You know what I mean? I hope so. Yeah. Earth Divers, number six from IDW, written by Stephen Graham Jones, art by David Gianfelice. We'll definitely talk about spoilers for this one. So... This is Earth Divers Kill Columbus is the first arc of this book where they've gone back in time to try to kill Christopher Columbus to change the course of American history. Here's the big spoiler here. They kill Columbus. Got him. Oh, dude. Got Got him. him. Don't spoil it for everybody. Got him. Oh, man. Uh, I was in Columbus Circle today, and mm -hmm. that statue's gone. Wow. Wow. I... Not to make this a theme of the podcast, this was the hardest issue for me to hold on to in terms of jumping around in time. Really like the art here. I really like what's going on, but there's a lot of stuff, particularly in the future timeline, that I'm not 100% sure how it connects to everything else. And I think part of that is this is an ongoing series. We're going to see them jump to the American Revolution next. So there's still mysteries that need to be uh, dragged out. But the past timeline with Columbus stuff, really well done and very tense. Yeah, the guy makes a sale out of some corpses, so that was uh, yeah, really reminiscent. Use, if you really. don't have, uh, you know, sometimes you got to use skin, you know what I mean? You got to be yeah. you're around the sea. You gotta, no, no, yeah, I definitely. I made, I, in the game. That's where the expression of the skin in the game comes from. Oh, I don't think we're yeah, I wrong. had to go to a wedding. I didn't have a dress shirt, so skin shirt. There, there you go. <laughs> skin Smart. in the game, man. Skin in the game. Smart. Uh, I agree with you, Alex. This was a little hard to under. But when you, you said this starts was the-, the collar, though, that's a tough part. It's hard. Skin. Well, you want to use some sort of the some really particular skin, like bottom of the foot skin, so you can really keep. The- oh, smart! Yeah, I so you keep a that. stiffer skin. You know. Yeah, yeah. That makes who's sense. your skin tailor? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, who's your skin guy? <laughs> It's a, it takes a lot. Uh, but what I was saying, Alex, was this the hardest of this series for you to follow or of all the books we've talked about? Because I think we had a lot of time no, no, jumping. No, 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 of this difficult. series. Of this because series, yes. I think there's been a lot of, there was a lot of jumping around in terms of the timelines that happened here. That to me, when I got to the end of they were like, next up, Earth Divers, American Revolution, or whatever they're calling that one. Yeah, That to me felt like, oh, okay, that explains it. They were holding on to some stuff. They were not putting everything on the table of this first series, which otherwise we've had two very straightforward stories being told with the future timeline and with this past timeline. Here there was a lot of jumping around, and it was a little harder well, to follow. And I wonder if we were reading the trade of this, if it would be there would be a little more clarity, because it does feel like after uh, Columbus is killed, we jump forward and sort of like, up. Ah, he, the stuff we thought was going to happen didn't happen, but it, it makes me not quite remember the details of what they were doing. It was, hard, it was hard to sort of sew the whole thing together, I think, at the end. And maybe on a trade read, you might um, have it more more present. That's fair. 
Well, I, I, I just want to say I like the idea of this, and I think the, the execution is interesting, and there's a lot of fun historical twists and things that we know that happen, and then they're making different choices, which is great, and it's a fun idea to explore. But I do agree with the Zelvatron, where it is it bounces around so much, it's hard to kind of like follow what's going on. But I am excited because they are taking big swings uh, to kind of check out what happens next. Yeah. Let's talk about Vanish number five from Image Comics, written by Donny Cates, art by Ryan Stegman. In this issue, we get a classic, is he actually in an insane asylum? Is this actually happening or not? And yeah, then we kind speaking of, of jumping around, there. another one that jumps around all over the place. We're just bouncing around the room, right, guys? Uh, I mean, this hey! was also, this is done, yep. This That's is done famous. That's a reference. That's for you, Pete, because I don't listen to those guys. Uh, so this was like done do famously in the a specific lyric from a very in the song. television show Moon Knight that we all are on board with, and no one would ever say anything mean about it. That's for sure, hundred uh, percent. I I gotta say, I love Tony Cates, love Ryan Stegman. I was a little disappointed in this. I particularly mm. because. It's not just in Moon Knight. It's been in so many supernatural TV shows. We got it just off the top of my head. Buffy the Vampire Slayer. We got a Penny Dreadful. I believe there was an episode of Lost that did it as well. There's been multiple mm. shows that have done this thing. We're like, is this character actually in an insane asylum? And you have a character as a doctor saying, is it crazier that you are a magic dude who is killing all these other dudes or that you're in an insane asylum the entire their entire time and daddy cates is a smart enough writer that i wish he had poked holes in that trope a little bit instead of leaning into that trope so that was a bit of a bummer to me but ryan stegman's aren't always good i still like the classic 90s image comic style of this comic book so i'm not out or anything but I wanted to know more of a level of meta awareness of what was going on. Yeah, I agree with that. I will say I thought this was a well done version of it. This was one mm -hmm. where it was actually hard to tell which is real. I feel like in a lot of the sort of cliches of this, you're like, well, the fun one is the real one. The insane asylum is not the real one. But yeah. in this, this one is written and, and drawn in a way where you're like, ah, it really could be either here. And honestly, I don't, we get sort of a reveal, but, I sort of doubted the reveal a little bit because they really leaned into the insane asylum. Yeah. I mean, you know, one of the tropes you forgot to talk about is the, uh, you know, anytime you're in a sale asylum, you're hoping the A team's going to show up and break out the, you know, one member so they can start fighting. Yeah. Uh, so that's I'm a guessing. classic trope. And who, classic who's trope. in it? Howling Mad Murdoch is locked in. Yeah, that's right. You're goddamn right. Yeah. That's right. in the name. Yep. Yeah. And they love that episode. They, they the trick. A -team. They, they trick him into trick him with Mr. T into drinking milk. Well, they trick Mr. T into flying because he hates flying. But they because he does. Uh, but they put stuff. They put a drug in his milk. Yeah, because he yeah. loves milk, but he hates flying. Well, of course, it does the body good. I mean, what are we doing here? And then but, face is really good looking. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Are oh, we going through the whole thing? Uh, but yeah, the cigar. I, the cigar guy's like, oh, I gotta. I gotta yeah, have this cigar. Terrible. Yeah, yeah. He loves it when yeah. a plan comes together. If we get, uh, oh man, <laughs> and then there's a woman who's there sometimes, and she doesn't <laughs> say or do much. Hey, come on, let's not undercut her. You know what I mean? Like, uh, I think know, the so. writers of the A Team did all the undercutting oh, yeah. there. That's 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 fair. Anyway. Alex, what's the matter? Yeah. Why you put it on a hat? Yeah. Uh, anyways, doing something. Uh, you're talking about A Team. Yeah, anyways, I, oh, I do think man. this is great, but me. it does jump around a lot. Um, so it's just so happy that. <laughs> can't believe that happened. What happened? This is well, too complicated. Do I really need, uh, should I explain no. a very no. long, complicated thing on the podcast? Nope. No, we don't have to. It's actually very short, and you're going to be grossed out. Are you ready? Nope. Yep. Okay, so my oldest kid, who is 13, had a one remaining baby tooth that was not coming out. It was pulled the other day, and at the end, they were like, hey, do you want to take the tooth home? And she was like, no, I don't want to take the tooth home. And they are like, okay, sounds good. And then the guy came back a minute later and was like, well, here's your tooth in a tiny little chest and handed it. And we were like, what? What? Okay, fine, we'll take it home. And we, I decided to show it to my wife. And now, because nobody wants this tooth over the past week, my wife and I keep hiding the tooth in different places where we can find it. Where... Busted. 
uh, and I can't believe she <laughs> she hid it under that hat in the little treasure chest. Good hide. Gotcha. Oh, uh, nice. Oh, yeah. My. We do that with other parts of our bodies in my house, too. We hide them. <laughs> other I know that's a weird, messed up thing. I'm sorry. Little scabs. We hide our scabs. I'm very and stuff impressed. Because I never would have taken that hat down other than. You know what's crazy is after you tell you us that story. About this. It, uh, it seems like we got the wrong person we're talking to. You know what I mean? It seems like that Marnie is of real creative hoot and would be fun to <laughs> talk She really is. Why don't we talk about another well, real creative quick, dude? Could, just an stuff. editing note. Let's. Um, I know we usually would say, like, edit that out. I think that's the part <laughs> we keep, and we edit out all the reviews. <laughs> <laughs> keep swap people guessing. Swap thing! Swap thing! Swap thing! <laughs> Green Hell, number three from DC Comics, written by Jeff Lemire, art by Doug Mackey and Sean Mole. This is a post-apocalyptic old man swamp thing world but it's also a little bit more of old man justice league dark because we got constantine mm. in here we got to come on and some other stuff as so they're all fighting against the end of the world um gross gross appropriately gross horror book i think yeah intense Agreed. uh covers very intense covers loved all the constantine stuff uh but yeah you know lemire does uh it does some creepy work so this is a, a great read, great, like just a- absolute end of the world. Something Jeff Lemire has written a ton of across a lot of his different work from Sweet Tooth all the way to uh, this I'm very hungry. book. Yeah, the uh, and so it's a good story and we pin a lot of it um, uh, on a, a father and daughter in a nice way. I thought this was definitely a good short little three issue read. Great. Good stuff. Damn them cheese balls. Damn them number six balls. from IDW, written by Simon Spurrier. Come on, Spurrier. say the real one. Damn them all, number six. Written there by Sp- Simon Spurrier, art by Charlie Adler. This is a all-out magic battle happening in London, I believe. Pete, what do you think about this? Uh, this continues to be great. We got a lot of answers in this issue. Uh, new deals are made. Art is super tight bananas. This is very fun, enjoyable shit. Of the books that coming out currently where demons are trapped in coins, this is uh, the the one I like better, I think. Uh, I like them both, but this one, like, I like sort of the very British language that is used in here. The characters uh, seem very lived in and real. And Great. I don't, the, we've had a little bit of a twist that I won't say at the end of this that I think is going to turn us into a whole new direction. Absolutely. Torrent number two from Image Comics, written by Mark Guggenheim, art by Justin Greenwood. So in the first issue of this book, we met a new superhero who was targeted by her arch enemy. Her arch enemy killed her husband in front of her after finding out her identity, took her son hostage and brought him to his stronghold. And this issue... We go in some surprising directions. I kind of expected it would be like a raid die hard type thing over the course of the Mm. series that's not the direction it goes in it goes in entirely different directions in this issue and we get a tease it's going to continue to go in different directions in the next issue i was on board from the first issue but given all these twists i'm all in now what about you guys interesting i agree i like uh the twists here and you know what this reminds me of this is like a grown-up kick-ass Mm-hmm. Is that an mm-hmm. apt comparison? Like it feels. Yeah, we mentioned that with the first issue. I think you weren't here. But oh, nice. Yes, one hundred percent. Well, I thought I was really on it with that one, but I guess we're all the same. The three of us. <laughs> Pete mentioned yeah. it last time. Yeah, I sure did. Me and Pete have never been off the same page. La page. <laughs> oh wow. <laughs> we're always on La Page. Uh, yeah, I just think that this uh, does take some interesting to it twists, which is very enjoyable. Um, uh you know and it's also kind of a thing that you don't expect to see ever so i don't really want to give it away but the thing the move she does at the end is like wow so uh, interesting to see if where it goes from there yeah i know we're dancing around spoilers but i think ultimately this is mark guggenheim writing at the top of his intelligence and i mean that Mm. legitimately in a complimentary way where it's not taking the easy way out of okay now she's going to fight her way up a tower for the next five issues instead we get that out of the way in this issue and then we move on to other things which is harder to write more challenging but ultimately more interesting 
GCPD, The Blue Wall, number six from DC Comics, written by John Ridley, art by Stefano Raphael. This is the final issue of the series, which has followed a bunch of rookie cops in Gotham. One of them has gone over the edge and is killing a bunch of other cops because of his treatment. Rene Montaya is directly going for him in this issue and dealing with some stuff herself, as well as the systemic problems that are happening in the GCPD. I was very iffy and very thrown about the direction in the last issue, but how do you all think this wrapped up? Good night, Pete. Oh, thanks. Uh, I like the way this book ended. I agree. It was this book sort of touched a lot of uh, edgier issues and sort of treated them sort of in your face, like not didn't sort of sugarcoat them at all and really just ran at them hard, let let the characters do bad things across the board to themselves and others. So it was a it was a raw read, I think, but I like the way it ended. I really like Renee Montoya. Great character that I wish we saw more of across all of DC Comics, even though she's sometimes the question and sometimes not. Uh, in this case, not. I like the way they talk about how Batman is bad for Gotham in this, uh, in a good way, in an interesting way, that is. And just a great, gritty, sort of grounded in reality uh, story about uh, hard, hard things, hard choices that, that police have to make here. Yeah, this is tough because uh, obviously we're talking about uh, police, and um, you know, there's a lot of feelings around police brutality and all sorts of uh, uh, hot topics. So the problem is we had this interesting kind of setup and hot story. pockets. Yep. Mm. Great. Thank you. Uh, we had this kind Hot of interesting, topics. We had this interesting kind of setup for the story. And I was hoping for something, uh, uh, I don't know, maybe that was going to say something or be something bigger. But at the end of the day, it was just kind of like, this is a fucking shitty system that will chew people up and spit them out. And life is fucking really hard. So I was kind of like, oh, all right. Well, I knew that. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I, I did appreciate, like Justin was saying that they didn't shy away from some things, lean into them. Uh, but I was hoping for a, a little bit, maybe, uh, different choices or something other than the reality of the shitty world that we actually live in. Um, well, I, I, so I don't think not to interrupt you, Pete, and I know you're not saying this, but I don't think we're going to get solutions for police brutality and systemic racism in a comic book. I think the idea here, if anything, was to present these ideas to comic book readers through the lens of Gotham City. The question in my mind is whether it was successful. And I think maybe maybe not and part of the reason i say maybe not is how thrown i was by the fourth and fifth issues that took this yeah. turn into this kid essentially becoming punisher because of racism which just did not work for me it was it was too much of a turn it was too much of a turn into like both hardcore realism and comic book surrealism at the same time which just did not gel and i agree with you i think this last issue on its own was a good renee montoya story but i don't know to the point that you're making pete that it felt worthwhile or went far enough based on how far they went to the previous issues so overall i think a worthwhile series and a well-meaning series that didn't quite work across the board. Yeah. Um, I have a completely unrelated question for you, Alex. Um, uh, for a while, we've talked about, we talked about the flash one minute war and in the last three or four stacks. It hasn't been here. Now are, have oh, you yeah. stopped reading it? Um, or are you trying to not talk about it with us? Cause we kept saying how the flash is fast. Tower number two from A Wave Blue <laughs> World, written by Cameron Johnson and Kelsey Barnard, art by Chris Cross. And this is taking place in a world where there is a very realistic video game that a bunch of folks have been sucked into. And a surprise twist in this issue, we immediately get to see the world outside of this game and some people who are controlling it, something I was not expecting at all to happen. And we get a lot more fights. I know we were Plus, in... Yeah. Take it away, plus, the, yeah. plus the Punisher hawk that shows up. There was, in fact, a, a hawk with a skull symbol on its chest. I 
Uh, I'm curious to hear what you guys think about this one, because I know we're intrigued by the first issue. How do you think it was followed up on in the second issue? Well, I, I still don't exactly know all the things that are happening, but uh, as a fan of The Punisher, I thought a Hulk with a skull on his chest was pretty cool. So I was like, all right, <laughs> I'll, I'll stick around for another one and hopefully get some more answers. Yeah. Just a real quick question. Do you think a Punisher bird would punish bird crimes or would he help out the Punisher to punish human crimes? Yeah, exactly. I think a little from column A, a little from column B, hopefully. You know what I mean? Okay. Would then he, the Punisher bird have to be like, hey, Frank, can you we go do some bird crimes now? Because we've, we've killed a lot of human criminals, but like you haven't really been focusing on the birds that I'm here for. Well, hopefully, if Frank's working with a Punisher hawk, he would, you know, uh, assist in, you know, their community as well, you know? So if you saw an issue where the Punisher's just killing birds, you'd be like, about time. About time. <laughs> about time. About fucking time. Great. This bird population is getting out of hand. That's true, yeah. I know, and his family was killed by other owl mobsters, right? <laughs> Came through and killed them. And there, but there was an underlying yeah. issue that he had from He was fighting in the trees him. of the park, and a couple of uh, stray bullets killed his family. They were stray having bullets? A, yeah, shout out were, to stray bullies. <laughs> shout out to stray bullies. Uh, they were having a worm picnic. <laughs> And uh, his whole family oh, died. And the thing with the worm picnic is you got to eat them fast because they're trying to they're going to try to get back in the ground. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. you're eating them. Yeah, and if you only eat half, you got another worm, baby. <laughs> you got to give it time though. You got to yeah. let it grow. Yeah. Or was that a line you were using if you're trying to pick up a bird? If you're trying to <laughs> flirt with a bird. Hey man, you know me. I'm always going to the park and flirting with birds. Are we talking about Tower Number Two? What did you think about that book? We so sure this. Are. This this comic, uh, I don't quite understand how the world works. Mm -hmm. And this feels we we talked about some other books that are like, oh, this feels like it is um, spraying. It sprung out of Squid Game. This feels the most like it sprung out of Squid Game. And just like, but what if it was a little more video gamey than maybe you think it would be? And that's where we are. But I I just don't quite understand the mechanics of it in reading this. And uh, but it's the art is interesting and the action is good. So I like it on it. I'll issue. throw out I like it on an individual panel by panel basis. But I don't think the action connects very well. And there's a couple of too many things going on with the storyline to completely follow what's happening. But. I don't know. I'm still intrigued by it. I feel like as they whittle down the amount of people that are in this game, it might be a little easier to follow. So I'm still mm. curious to check out the third issue. Speaking yeah. of third issue, I guess I would say I would say the Flash is very fast. Mm. Infernal Girl Red number three from Image Comics, written by Matt Groom, art by Erica Durso. This is the final issue of this part of Infernal Girl Red, though she will be back. Uh, we finally get her. Um, inhabiting all of her power fighting yeah. against this dude who has stolen the university she was going to from earth and put it into space um one of the things that i loved about this book though they're not very explicit about it is it's clearly teeing up some big things for the massive verse big mythology things that are going on both with inferno Girl red and the enemy that everybody is seemingly going to be fighting in the massive verse if you're wondering what the stakes are here i think it lays those out pretty cleanly and also it gives a really tragic origin story for inferno Girl red it. Yeah, yeah yeah exactly it's very emotional it was very really... anytime good I was just going to say, it, uh, you know, love the emotional kind of story. I loved all the uh, dragon action we got in this. There's a cool anime feel to the art style. Uh, I, I am having a blast with this. The uh, I was, Anytime I read a massive book and I'm like, how do all these books just really do it? And I'm trying to crack the code. And I feel like it has something to do with just a... A, the, the guardrails are up on what type of story we're telling here. It's like straight superhero action, maybe inspired by uh, some video game logic and pacing where it's just like you're thrown into it. The superpowers in the power sets are pretty well defined in all these books across the board. Same here. And then adding in like great emotional moments like we get at the end of this and just nice characters that talk to each other pretty clearly. Uh, so it's just the, to boil all that down, it's like, just good comic storytelling is making every massive book good. Am I a genius for saying that? No. No, no I'm not. No, you're not. 
Deceased War of the Undead Gods, number seven from DC <laughs> Comics, written by Tom Taylor, art by Trevor Harrison and Luca Meyer. In this issue, Alfred, who is now the Spectre, goes back to Earth to get the cure for the zombie virus, something that they confusingly have not brought with them, despite the fact that they're dealing with I would have brought virus. it. Right? I would have packed. But you know when you're packing for a trip and you're like, I'm not going to need all this zombie yeah. cure. And then you're like, no, we that's the one thing we needed. <laughs> oh, my God. I forgot it. Ah, uh, the one thing I needed. We didn't pack it. That I didn't bring my, my skis one with the to issue. the ski I'm, trip. I'm enjoying this series. But the entire issue, I was like, why do they not have any zombie cure on them when they know that zombies are a problem? And then Alfred was like, I got to go to Earth. And he comes back from Earth. And he's like, guess what I got? Zombie cure. And they're like, ah, oh, thanks, Alfred. Great job. Smile, Alfred. Fred. It's Smart. like his uh, version of superpowered cucumber sandwiches. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. He's buttling. He's just very. He's buttling on a very large scale. On here. a cosmic he scale. Bring yeah. Cosmic, cosmic butler. Uh, hello, spinoff. Let's go. Uh, great great time. Yeah. Why don't uh, we move on to the next book? Yeah. No, I think that uh, this is just crazy stuff. I love the cyborg moment where he's like, "I have all of Brainiac's powers." Is crazy. Amazing last panel. Yeah, I, I think this is just a blast. Great horror moment when Damien gets infected with the anti-life. Uh, I thought that was awesome and scary. In general, I've loved this. I want more of this and DC versus vampires all day. Immortal Sergeant number three from Image Comics, written by Joe Kelly, art by Ken Nomura. This is about a cranky, racist, old Come sergeant on. who is about to retire. He has been teamed up with his... Totally liberal soy boy son <laughs> who is taken around to a bunch of bars. But we get a reveal of what the actual plot is finally in this issue. Pete, uh, you're digging this, so what do you think? Yeah, I mean, you know, uh, maybe I relate to it because my father is a ridiculous human being. and uh, But I just think it's one of those things where uh, this is a fun kind of odd couple scenario just kind of turned up to 11 where, uh, you know, the old guy is right. And also, uh, kind of like has a plan. And this young guy has kind of got to play along with all this madness. And there's a lot of over the top action, but also Joe Kelly does a good job of balancing some humor in there. And you're kind of laughing at the ridiculousness of it all. Yeah. This book is wild. Really key keeps catching me off guard with the choices that are made and it, f it feels really original the art is uh, totally works and is uh really interesting the i find it interesting pete that you identify with the the sun in this mm -hmm. um as as our resident curmudgeon like it uh it feels like you could identify with both characters maybe here yeah yeah it does uh, feel that way thank you for pointing that out also the art is just crazy type bananas Superman number two from DC Comics, written by Joshua Williamson, art by Jamal Campbell. In this issue, Superman is fighting against an army of parasites who are taking over Metropolis. Lex Luthor is buzzing in his ear, trying to get the team up together, and Superman, of course, doesn't want to do it. I really dug the first issue of this, and I really like the first, second issue of this as well. This is an exciting, propulsive Superman story. It's like almost like a horror take on Superman. Mm -hmm. the, the the art is much darker and moodier than a lot of other Superman books, and the what happens is scary uh, throughout, except for the like three or four pages where Superman meets a new character who is it's like a crazy introduction where it's like who are you? Uh, here's a bunch of information about me, and I'll say my name right as I leave. Uh, yeah, I, I I love the art on this. I feel like it's a fun kind of cool, clean take on Superman. Uh, th yeah, this was a blast. Loving this story, like this kind of whole uh, Superman Lex Luthor back and forth here in this. And for my recipe, I guess it's going to be Supermanicotti. And what you're going to do is you're going to take <laughs> red kryptonite and... Don't one. interrupt him. Keep going, Justin. <laughs> <laughs> I'll have you know, I ran out of gas right after I said Superman and Cotty. <laughs> yeah, if you'd like to support this podcast and all the podcasts we do, as well as our recipe blog, patreon.com slash comic book club. Also, we do a live show every Tuesday night at 7 p.m. to crowd, not crowdcast, Facebook and YouTube. Come Ugh. check it out. 
Rip Crowdcast. We would love to talk to you about comic books. Apple, Spotify, Stitcher, or the app of your choice to subscribe, listen, and follow the show at Comic Book Live on Twi- Twitter, Comic Book Club Live on TikTok, and Instagram, comicbookclublive.com for this podcast and many more. Until next time, we'll see you at the comic book shop. That was really fun. I guess we'll call it Comic Book Club's One Bad Day. Mm. Sweet. <laughs>